Hello friends! Welcome back. My name's Ramon. How are you today? So, recently I saw this video on TikTok with some girl that got really upset because she saw that a brand had advertised a specific ingredient on the front of the packaging, but decided to use a derivative by looking at the ingredients on the back of it. Got into a little bit of a heated exchange with her. Fundamentally, I can understand the problem behind it. For the person who's not necessarily well versed on formulation, ingredients, skincare, and whatnot, you fully expect that when you look at an ingredients list, you're gonna essentially see the exact same things that are marketed on the front of the packaging, right? And sometimes it might even be just in a different name but then sometimes you see derivatives and derivatives oftentimes are completely different names and so you're like well what's the point of advertising this ingredient if it's a derivative aka a completely different ingredient i get that then you have me who i'm currently in formulation school i love ingredients this is something that i study i love i'm really passionate about and so i understand entirely why certain brands might want to use specific derivatives of certain ingredients in formulations for x y and z reason so that's what i'm going to talk about today but before i get into it i'm going to ask that you hit the subscribe button and notification bell so that you know when i post more skincare sunscreen and fancy related content on my channel give the video a thumbs up and down below what are some derivatives you actively see in skincare formulations that you really like and or what are your opinions on using derivatives in skincare products instead of the original ingredients sound off so what is a derivative and what's the point of using those in formulation well derivatives are literally what that is it's a derivative of the original ingredient whether it's vitamin c retinoids whatever that are used in formulations for specific reasons that make it easier to use in formulation or easier to use on the skin in essence what they are is the exact same ingredient that's either had a process done to it or it's been derived in a different way so that it's still that same ingredient but there's something a little bit different to it that makes the chemical properties of it a little bit different to use and a little bit different to work with think of it like bacon you have bacon but you can have smoked bacon or you can have maple glazed bacon bacon. These are still bacon in essence, but they're different forms of it that give you a different experience, a different overall usage, a different overall feel. And why would you want to use a derivative? Well, oftentimes, as I mentioned, there's an entirely different chemical property to these derivatives, even if they are just offshoots of the main ingredient. It can be the fact that the primary ingredient isn't necessarily stable, isn't easy to use in the formulation of a specific vehicle, or it's not really good for a specific skin type. Therefore, coming out with a derivative makes it easy to use in certain formulations, makes it a lot more stable. It can be a lot easier and more tolerable to use for most, if not all, skin types, and or it's easier to penetrate into the skin and therefore you're getting a lot more results from it as a result of that. And so basically what we're gonna do in this video is I'm gonna go and touch on a few of the gold standard active ingredients, what derivatives are used sometimes in their place or along with them and why we use them. First and foremost, vitamin C. And we all know L-ascorbic acid is the pure, most researched, most well-proven form of vitamin C there is. And most of us know that the tea behind ascorbic acid is, is she's problematic. She's very temperamental. She's not the easiest to use in most formulations. L-ascorbic acid is very hard to stabilize or have in a certain vehicle and keep it stable. It oxidizes very easily. On top of that, used at certain percentages, L-ascorbic acid, can have some irritating effects for a lot of people. It's not the most well tolerated, especially because to have it in a very stable formulation, oftentimes, if it's not encapsulated or whatnot, it has to be held at a very low pH, so it's kind of acidic. And on top of that, sometimes it's a little bit difficult to ensure that the ascorbic acid in itself is able to penetrate through the skin barrier so that it's able to have the effects biologically in our skin. And so that's when we have derivatives. And there's a lot of derivatives we see in place of, or along with ascorbic acid in formulations that are used because they're a lot more stable, they're able to penetrate a lot more effectively, and or they give you certain specific results of ascorbic acid that you might wanna see in that specific skin product or for your specific skin concerns. And these are, in no particular order, ascorboglucoside, sodium ascorbophosphate, magnesium ascorbophosphate, tetrahexodecal ascorbate, ethoscorbic acid, and 3-O-ethyl ascorbic acid as well. And depending on which one of these these are, whether it's the sodium or magnesium ascorbophosphate or whatnot, these are essentially vitamin C that have been ethylated or gone through a separate process where something's attached to them to make them the derivative itself. It's still vitamin C fundamentally, it's still the ascorbic acid, but something's been added to it or it's gone through a specific process to make it a different form of that vitamin C so that it's easier to use or a different version of that to use in formulations. And here's the tea with that is that not all of these necessarily are going to be as well proven or as well studied to give you all of the benefits that ascorbic acid is known for. And so a lot of times, depending on what the formulation or the product is, you're going to find a specific derivative that has specific benefits that that product is going to highlight. For example, sodium and magnesium ascorbyl phosphates. They are great antioxidants. They're really good at helping with brightening pigmentation related issues, but they might not be the best at collagen synthesis, for example. And so a lot of times you're going to see those in brightening hyperpigmentation focused products. Sodium ascorbyl phosphate even has antibacterial properties, so sometimes you're going to see it in acne-related products or products geared for more oily, acne-prone skin. And so next we have hyaluronic acid, and the tea with that one is that sometimes, if not most times, instead of hyaluronic acid, you're often going to find sodium hyaluronates on the ingredients list. And the tea with that is that they are pretty much one and the same ingredient. If you look at the chemical compound of hyaluronic acid versus that of sodium hyaluronate, 
they are the same thing. The only difference is that sodium hyaluronate has the additional sodium attached to it. So it is a salt form of hyaluronic acid. Why is that one used? Well, basically it's a version of the ingredient that's a little bit more effective and a lot easier to penetrate into the skin. It's able to penetrate and thus give you the humectant, hydrating, plumping benefits of hyaluronic acid at a much deeper level. But again, it's one and the same. They're the same exact ingredient, but most times where you're gonna see hyaluronic acid on the front, you're most likely gonna see sodium hyaluronate on the back. Next ingredient, and she's a complicated one. Retinoids. We all know the tea with retinoids. We know they are very well studied. They are very well proven to give you so many results. You have anti-aging, especially targeted towards fine lines in collagen synthesis. They help with pigmentation, acne, skin texture, everything. And we know that with retinoids, there are many different derivatives of the ingredient as well. You have retinoic acid, retinol, retinol, retinol palmitate. And we know through research and proven studies that all of them essentially get back to retinoic acid to give you the benefits that retinoids are famous for. And we know that those are the proven derivatives. But then we know that there are other derivatives of retinoids that might not be in the same circles as those. And those are going to be hydropinacolone retinoates as well as Bacuchia. Let's start with HPR. HPR essentially is a newer ingredient. It's a bit green, but she's also a very hot ingredient. And so HPR is used in a lot of big name brand products. For example, it's in The Ordinary's Grain Active Retinoid. It's used in Sunday Rayleigh's Luna. And while sometimes she's featured with a retinoid in tandem, sometimes you're gonna find her by herself. And see with that is a lot of brands claim that there's a lot of studies and a lot of research done around HPR to prove that it's just as effective as retinoids, especially because it's technically a direct offshoot of straight retinoic acid. You don't require the conversions required by all the other retinoid derivatives and therefore you're going to get more direct results. But the tea with that is that there's not actually a lot of really proven clinical peer-reviewed studies to say that. The one study that there really is is done by Estee Lauder who owns a lot of these brands. Therefore it's kind of really questionable as to how beneficial it really is. The other ingredient we see a lot that's actually not even a retinoid is Bacuchia which has been really hot in 2020 in my opinion with a lot of brands stating that oh she's nature's retinol. But the tea with that is that it's it's a natural plant botanical extract. It's in no way related to vitamin A. And while there are some studies that do show that it does have the same biological effects as retinoids in skin cells, we can't say that it's one and the same necessarily. And there's also a lot of research we need to do to make those claims. And so we do have very proven derivatives. We also have some not so proven derivatives. And oftentimes you're gonna find them paired up together, which actually I think is a lot better because again, Bacuchia does have some benefits to it. I just don't think it should claim it's nature's retinol. But then sometimes you're gonna find each of those by themselves in a product. And I think that's a little bit more weary, something you should really look out for just because again, I'd rather have more of the proven benefits and the not so proven benefits in my skincare. And the last ingredient we're gonna talk about, and it's the whole reason I'm making this video, and that's azelaic acid. And so, you know, azelaic acid, that's my girl. That's the one ingredient I really wanna see get its acclaim and its shine in 2021. And azelaic acid does a lot for us. It's very similar to niacinamide and retinoids in that it has a lot of benefits to it, and it's a very proven ingredient as a result of that. It's great for acne, it's great for anti-inflammatory benefits, it's great at texture and pigment related issues. It does a lot and it's a very well tolerated ingredient. But the tea behind it is that with formulating azelaic acid, it's not easy to do. It's not an ingredient that's necessarily very readily water soluble. And the tea with the research behind azelaic acid is that most of the research and studies behind it are have it at 20% in those clinical studies. And once you start formulating with that much azelaic acid, it tends to get a little bit less cosmetically elegant. And so brands have to figure out a way to work around that. And that's when you have derivatives like potassium potassium azeloyl diglycinate, which are going to be A, a lot easier to formulate, especially in more lightweight water-based vehicles, but also B, it's an ingredient that has studies and research behind it that has a lot of the same benefits as azelaic acid, but in much lower percentages and concentrations. When you see a lower percentage of PAD in formulations, you can hope that you're getting a lot of the same results as azelaic acid in terms of how it takes care of rosacea, pigment, and acne-related problems. And again, much like the vitamin C derivatives, PAD is very much a direct derivative of azelaic acid. Azelaic acid is still very much a part of the initial compound. It's just gone under glycation and adding a couple different compounds like glycine and potassium hydroxide to make it the compound that it is. But fundamentally, azelaic acid is still very much a part of that molecule. And by using this ingredient instead of azelaic acid, you're able to get a lot more lightweight, very, very cosmetically elegant products while still getting a lot of the same benefits as azelaic acid. And with that, those are a lot of the primary ingredients and derivatives I wanted to speak about. Again, fundamentally, these compounds, these derivatives, are very much direct offshoots of the original ingredients, the original compounds, often just gone through a specific process like esterification or glycation to give you a derivative that fundamentally still contains the original compound, but just in a different format so it's easier to work with or it's a lot easier to use as an individual or a consumer. And therefore, I don't think we necessarily need to accuse brands of deception or lying to us just because we see the derivative of an ingredient versus the actual ingredient that's advertised on the front of the packaging. And with that, that's my video. Thank you guys for watching. Down below in the comments, what are your thoughts? What are your opinions on everything I just talked about? What are some of your favorite derivatives in skincare and skincare products that you find work really well for you or that you'd like to see? Don't forget to give this video a thumbs up, hit that subscribe button and notification bell so that you know when I post more skincare, sunscreen, and fancy related content on my channel. Thanks for watching, guys. Bye.